Thank you so much. Thank you for that generous and very long introduction. Um, <laughs> um, the introduction focused a lot on my work with C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, my two favorite authors. What I like more than even reading their works is looking at their friendship and the important impact that friendship makes. I believe that creativity thrives in community and that we need one another to bring out the best in one another. And that's the message of a lot of those Lewis and Tolkien and the Inklings kinds of projects. But I'm not here to talk about C.S. Lewis, although I know that if I don't quote him or somebody doesn't quote him at some point, people will be disappointed. So thank you for that introduction. I'm glad we snuck in our Lewis quote for the day. Uh, what I want to talk to you today about today is uh, intellectual hospitality. So the message of my life, the driving force behind pretty much everything that I do is this conviction that there is an enemy of our souls and it's manifest throughout our culture. And what it wants to do is destroy us by dividing us. <clears throat> That division is the enemy's key weapon, dividing us from one another, <clears throat> dividing us from God, and splintering the various aspects of our personalities so that we no longer live in this harmony that God intends for us. If we're going to do that, and we're going to do that well, and we're going to do that wisely, then we need to learn how to deal with people who violently disagree with us and our way of doing things. Now, you saw the videos uh, and perhaps had an opportunity to talk about them a little bit, and you know that the statistics are very clear that it's not your imagination, that we are more divided than we have ever been before as a culture. And that what we think of as kind of a continuum of beliefs isn't anymore a kind of continuum. It's what they call a bimodal curve. People are moving away from the middle and more toward the extremes. And there are a number of societal aspects of that shift. But I don't need to prove it to you because we've all felt it. We've all found, any of, any of you who've lived more than 20 years or so, I think that may be most of us, <laughs> we've seen that even the ability to talk charitably to people who have a, ver a different opinion from ours, or to try to come to some kind of agreement, or what we used to say a lot, to agree to disagree, just doesn't seem even possible anymore. We used to talk about hot button topics, but I don't know that there's been a time when it's been so hard to simply mention certain things. We stay away from certain topics because they are not just hot button, they're too hot to handle. So what I wanna to talk to you about today is intellectual hospitality. How do we begin to bridge that gap and how do we begin to uh, really deal with one another with kindness and curiosity and humility when we can't come to an agreement about things. So this is what I wanna to do today. I'm going to talk about two underlying attitudes that I think uh, really help to set up what I want to uh, share about the practicalities. I want to define intellectual hospitality and why I think it's a useful concept. I want to talk about the questions that I think help us to bridge the gap when there are differences. And then I want to talk, if we have time, for just a little bit, just a few moments, about what happens when intellectual hospitality is not possible. Because despite our best efforts, sometimes we can't agree to disagree. And sometimes we are in the heartbreaking situation of either having to establish boundaries or having others establish boundaries with us. And we need to know how to talk about that because sometimes that's where things end up, especially with those we're in deeper relationships with one another. So let me talk about these two underlying attitudes, two underlying attitudes that I think will kind of help set up everything else. This is not on your handout. The, the first one is an attitude that values the person by making a distinction between the person and the issue, the topic, or the ideology. 
I think that there's a really important difference between how we treat people and how we treat ideas. Let me give you an example. If you happen to have had any experience with someone who is an alcoholic, then you know how heartbreaking that particular disease can be. I hate alcoholism because I've seen it destroy so many lives. But I don't hate the alcoholic. I don't hate the person who is struggling, who's subject to that problem, to that issue, to that disease. I believe that it is appropriate to have contempt for an idea, but that it's never okay to have contempt for an individual. Never. Never. Because we're all broken, we're all fallible, and we're all made in the image of God. We need to love each other with the kind of love that God loves us with despite our failings. And I believe that that's non-negotiable. It is never appropriate to have contempt. Contempt is a, dis is a um, combination of hate and disgust. It is never appropriate to have contempt for a person. But I think we are wise sometimes to hate certain ideas that are poisonous or destructive, to hate certain conditions, to hate certain assumptions. But love for people, love for the individual, and the hope that we can somehow reach the person who is perhaps in bondage to deception, to wrong thinking, or to other kinds of issues. Love is always called for. Kindness is always needed. So that's one assumption. Value the person. Love the person. Though it's okay to hate the particular attitude or issue or perspective. Here's the second assumption that I think is really helpful for us as we move forward in learning uh, to do a better job with intellectual hospitality. And that is cultivating a gratitude for difference. Cultivating a gratitude for difference. So a lot of times we are suspicious of difference. We're disoriented by difference. We're distressed by difference. And when we have a negative attitude toward difference, then what we try to do is we try to resolve difference. We try to do what I think a lot of times we try to do when there's difference. We try to find common ground. But sometimes that's not possible. So, and a lot of times it's not helpful. Sometimes we need to simply be grateful for difference. Why is difference good for us? It shows us our limits. It helps us to understand that maybe we are not the seat of all wisdom. What? <laughs> Once more for the back row. Maybe, possibly, it might just be conceivable that we're wrong, really wrong, or maybe not wrong, but that our view is this big and God is calling us to a view that is this big. Maybe we are limited by our own personalities, our own life experiences. Maybe our point of view isn't the last word. Think about what it would mean for us to celebrate and enjoy and appreciate the fact that other people look at things differently. If our first response was, that's interesting, that's interesting. I don't look at it that way, but tell me more about that. If we looked at it as an opportunity to learn, to grow, to shift, to become a more well-rounded person. So those two attitudes, a gratitude toward difference, an excitement about ways that we can learn for each other, from each other, and also a commitment to always love the person. I think are the two underlying attitudes. Those set the stage for what I call intellectual hospitality. If you look on your handout, there is a work in, working definition. And I just want to walk through this with you because I think it may be helpful. As I said, intellectual hospitality does not equal looking for common ground. It's not even quite agreeing to disagree. It's a little bit more robust than that. And here's my working definition. 
Intellectual hospitality occurs when persons of goodwill, let me stop you there, right there. Intellectual hospitality assumes that the persons involved are persons of goodwill. Therefore, intellectual hospitality is not possible between all persons. Because if you don't start with goodwill toward that other person or that person does not begin with goodwill toward you, it's very hard to have intellectual hospitality. So here we're assuming the persons who are engaged are engaged with goodwill for good and not harm, for love and not destruction. Persons of goodwill engage with one another with the goal, not of changing each other's mind, not of being heard, but with the goal of greater understanding. When we engage in intellectual hospitality, our goal is simply, help me understand more than I do right now. It is modeled on the ancient practice of offering sanctuary to the stranger. If you've read your Odyssey and your Iliad, if you read your Homer way back in the day, <laughs> you heard about a concept called Zania, hospitality, sometimes called the guest host contract, which was a contract that was kind of put into place in a culture that did not have hotels. So way back in the day, a traveler would be looking for some sanctuary, some place to stay at night, and there weren't ho their own hotels. So they would knock on a door, and they would ask for a place to stay for the night. And doing that, very different from what we do now, doing that in that day and age was uh, guided under certain guidelines. Guidelines that constrain the host and guidelines that constrain the guest. The guest had certain obligations. The host had certain obligations. The host had an obligation to offer food, shelter, a night's sleep, a bath, and a gift. Wow. And the, guest, or the host had an obligation to offer all of those things without asking the identity of the guest. The guest, on the other hand, had obligations to respect the property and persons of the household and also to leave a gift or a blessing on that household, right? To respect the guidelines of the household. And the story of the Odyssey, if you've read that, great, that story, is a story of various households where one or the other, the host or the guest, keep breaking the rules and havoc ensues not only among people, but among the gods. So intellectual hospitality is modeled on this idea that both parties have responsibilities. They honor the specific guidelines that constrain both the host and the guest. Intellectual hospitality is built on mutual respect, care for the person, and it serves as a practical expression of humility, patience, and curiosity. Those are the three characteristics or qualities that guide intellectual hospitality. One is humility, the assumption that you may know some things I don't. <laughs> you may have a different perspective and your perspective may be just as valid as mine. That I have limits. Patience. I think a lot of times a little patience goes a really long way. Any of us who are parents, know that the pause may be the most important thing that happens in any conversation, rather than reacting. We pause, <laughs> we take a breath, we whisper a prayer. That moment may be the magic moment that everything else hinges upon, patience. And then curiosity, the desire to learn more. I know this about you Bereans. I know that you're curious curious and eager to learn more, open to new ideas. I've seen that every time I've been among you. And I think it's a wonderful, wonderful quality. So how do we apply these principles? Uh, that Any questions about that definition, by the way? Anything there that I can clarify for you, having walked you through that? What was the, could you spell the name of that? Oh, Zania. It's X-E-N-I-A. 
Yes, thank you for that good question. Zania. It's a city in Ohio. Zania is? <clears throat> it is not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Very good. Good to know. So there's my working definition. I think it may be helpful, it may be clarifying about what is and is not included when we're talking about intellectual hospitality. In the video that you saw, you noticed that I encourage us to learn how to ask great questions. And I want to park here a little bit because I think that a lot of the questions that I get is that all sounds really good, but how do you do it? What does it actually look like? You're sitting there, somebody has some really wild idea that's completely different from you, and you're thinking, okay, she said something about pausing and something about being quiet for a minute, but what do I do? What do I do next? How do I proceed? I think that there are three key categories of questions that make intellectual hospitality possible, that make it practical, that make it come alive that help us to build bridges between very, very different points of view. So the first one is asking a clarifying question. Somebody expresses perhaps a view on a political issue, political candidate, hot button topic. And the first thing that tends to happen is all kinds of assumptions flood our minds. Oh, no, you must be one of those. You must think thus and so. Oh, gosh, I saw your kind of person on the news. Right, right? We All these assumptions. In other words, when they say where they stand, a lot of times we think, oh, I know what that is. I know all the parts of that, and I don't like it. I was trying to think of an example that I could give you, a hypothetical example that might help us to walk through why that's problematic. So let's assume I have a son. I don't, so that makes it a safe assumption. <laughs> let's assume I have a son, and he's 20 years old, and he comes to me, and he says, Mom, thank you for sending me to Christian school. I love this Christian college, and I have decided to become a Buddhist. <laughs> Where, did <I> go wrong? <laughs> Where did I go wrong? What, what, what do I say now? How do I like get him back on track? Did he just lose his salvation all these years? And now he's going to betray me. All these things are going to flood my mind and my heart. How could you betray the faith in which you were raised? Right? How about instead of that, I kind of, kind of hold all that at bay for a minute. And I start asking questions. Oh, that's very interesting. I love that, by the way, when someone says something really outrageous, you know. Whatever the topic is, abortion, gun control, capital punishment, former President Trump, when your first reaction is just hold that at bay a little bit, and you say, that's interesting. Can you tell me more about that? You've decided to become a Buddhist. That's how interesting. <laughs> Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, he says to me. My son says, you know, there's a guy in my class, and he's a Buddhist, and he eats vegetables. So I'm going to start eating more vegetables. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, because being a Buddhist means that you, you eat more vegetables. And then, and then he says, in one of my classes, we watched that movie, that inconvenient guy. I, I don't remember him, but he's really inconvenient. And he said something about, like, saving the earth. We got to save the earth and stuff. And so I know that Buddhists really care about the planet. So I have started recycling. <laughs> what, a, what a good impulse, right? Um, could you give me an example, right? Can you give me an example of that? Well, you know, we used to just always throw our trash. Now I'm going to start like keeping the bottles and the cans and the cardboard, you know, and I'm going to start saving that because I think that that's a really important Buddhist priority. <laughs> So I'm thinking to myself, you're going to eat more vegetables and you're going to start recycling and caring about the planet and not just, you know, your room. And <laughs> to, you see how this is going a way different place than what I thought? And, I, and then I say, you know, is, is, there, is there more to this picture? He says, no. But I have, I have a friend, I have a 
a friend who's a Buddhist, and one of the things I really appreciate him about him is he has incredible peace. You know, I feel like I'm frantically running around all the time. But my friend Sean, he says that Buddhist principles have helped him to kind of cal calm down a little bit. And he says the most important things that he do thing that he does is he sits quietly and he talks to God. And I haven't done that. That hasn't been part of my practice. So I think that's what I'm going to start doing. Mom, do you think it'd be okay if I started spending 15 or 20 minutes every morning just sitting quietly and listening to what God has to say to me? <laughs> Does that example help you understand why curiosity is so important and how, how so often we assume that we know what the person means when they say, I support abortion rights or I am opposed to, to gun control laws, or I voted for fill in the blank. We assume we know what that means to them and why they did that, what their motives are. And I think a lot of the time when we ask, we realize that what we think they meant and what they actually meant are very, very different. This is where patience and curiosity becomes very helpful. Because in my hypothetical situation, think about what it would have been if I would have said, Buddhism, that's totally opposed to Christianity. What's wrong with you? Right? And I would have closed the door to a more robust prayer life, love for the planet, and better care of self. And I think a lot of times we have to be really, really sure that when someone says something, we understand what they, they mean by that. What do you mean by that? What's included in that? What's not included in that? And that can be very, very helpful. So asking, what do you believe? Help me understand where you're coming from is the first great question. Here's the second one. Oh, gosh, this is so important. Asking, what information is that based on? Now, if you've been studying anything about the contentiousness of our culture, you've probably heard the idea of siloing. That back in the olden days, this is really far back. Some of you may not even ever heard of this before, but back in the olden days, there were only three TV channels. And t <laughs> t have you heard that? And then at night, they would sign off, and there'd be no TV until the next day? Right? And they played Star Spangled Banner. And they played a Star, they did. There you go. Right? Back in the olden days, we all got our information at the same time from the same reliable source. Because there was very, very few opportunities to get the day's news. We read the same newspapers. We heard the same newscasters. Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite, right? Whether you love him or not, that, you know, we, what, I, what I'm trying to say is back in the day, we all started with the same fundamental building blocks of information. That is no longer the case. That is no longer the case. The news that one person listens to might come primarily from TikTok. And the news that another person listens to may come primarily from a newsletter that they get from a conservative Christian group. These two groups are not just going to be different in their conclusions. They're going to be different in their fundamental knowledge base. So. What information is your perspective based on becomes a very important question. Because when you ask that question, what, why did you vote for that um, perspective? Why did you vote for that person? Why did you vote for that proposition? Someone may say something, and then you get to ask the question, well, what is, it? What is that based on? Where, where did you hear that? Oh, I heard, right? Oh, I heard such and such. Really, that's interesting. Where did you hear that? Because that contradicts something that I heard. I remember when uh, the George Floyd situation erupted in our nation. And in down to my little town, in downtown Glendora, there was a Black Lives Matter rally. And I knew personally a number of the people who were there. 
So about a week or two ago, I was talking with a friend. She was shaking her head and she was saying, even here in our little town of Glendora, the rioters almost broke down the police station when that George Floyd thing happened. I said, really? What is that based on? Oh, I heard it. I heard it from a friend. That's really interesting. And then this is really helpful. That's really interesting. I heard something different. Would you be interested in hearing a different perspective? I heard something different. And I was able to share with this person my conversations with three different individuals who were there that day. And their experience was extraordinary. The police officers came out of the police station, talked with them for almost 40 minutes, and at the end of that time knelt and prayed with them. Somehow that didn't make the news report that this friend of mine had heard. She heard something. But see, the problem there in viewing that event is that we had a different fundamental fact load, right? We were building our assumptions on different facts about the situation. And the goal was not to argue about whether Black Lives Matter is a valid organization or whether a rally should have occurred. It was to track it down to the fundamental information base and to say, here's where the problem is. You heard one thing. I heard something entirely different. That's an interesting statistic. That's an interesting trend. That's an interesting quotation. Where did you hear that? I heard something different. Would you be interested in hearing my point of view or what I heard? Right. So we call into question some of the fundamental foundations for some of these attitudes and opinions then we do, in fact, create some common ground. So the question, what information is that based on? Help me broaden my awareness. Because I assume the person I'm talking with is siloed in some way. They're getting their news from a particular stream of sources. I'm getting mine, perhaps, from another. But if I can tap into what they're hearing, that expands my understanding of what else is going on in the world. So when I think about question number two, what information is that based on? I think about basically the question, what did I miss? What did I miss? You, you obviously picked up something that I missed. What did you hear and where did that come from? And so then we can, we are in a different place when we're talking about the same assumptions in terms of information. So the question, what do you believe? So that we have clarity about what the person is actually saying instead of assumptions about what people like that think. What information is that based on helps me broaden my awareness. And even if we continue to violently disagree, we have each at least been introduced to the possibility that the thing that we're assuming is not true or is only partially true or is distorted in some way. The third question. So right at the bottom of your handout, right? Applying hospitality to the world of ideas. The third question, letter C. What moral priorities is that based on? What moral priorities is that based on? Another way to ask the same question is this. Help me understand what is at stake from your point of view. I've come to believe that a lot of times when we disagree about something, what's really happening is that there are two values that are competing with each other. And the question isn't whether you're right or wrong, good or bad. The question is, which of those priorities is primary? So remember back when you were in, um, High school, you probably uh, you heard this in the video, and, and let me remind you um, what's sometimes called the Nazi at the door scenario, right? A Nazi knocks at your door and says, are you hiding Jews in your house? And two priorities come into competition. The competition that truth matters 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You're supposed to tell the truth. You're not supposed to lie or deceive. And then the other priority, the inestimable value of a human life. Life is to be preserved. Life is sacred. Life matters. So do you tell the truth and let the Nazi officer kill them? Do you lie and violate the sanctity of truth? You see, what's happening there is that two competing goods are in competition with one another. You're in a situation that in some ways is a no-win situation. Whatever you do, you're kind of stuck. I think that a lot of the... Um, arguments, a lot of the topics that we fight about these days are actually fights worth having because there are underlying values that are competing. Right? Gun control, if I, can, if I dare to name a hot button topic, disagreements about gun control. On the one hand, we have the value of protecting lives. On the other hand, we have the value of protecting liberties. How much are we going to let the government interfere with my choices and my decisions? Those are both good things. Those are both really important things. We're in a hard spot because those two competing goods, we can't have both of them. It's hard to find a compromise between them. It's hard to move forward. Where are we stuck? Like in a lot of situations, we're stuck at the point where those two goods come head to head. But you heard me say in the video, you heard me say in my lecture, that one of the really, really lovely places, one of the really, really good fruits of good intellectual hospitality is that we can get to a place where we can say to one another, I utterly and completely disagree with you, but I love the reasons why you believe what you do. I don't have a teenage son. I do have a daughter. And shockingly enough, we disagree on all kinds of stuff. <laughs> yes, sorry, Bob, we do. <laughs> And we have argued, and we have screamed, and we have cried. And I will tell you what I don't tell very many people. She's the one I had that fight with, and she's the one who first said, Mom, I completely disagree with you. I totally and utterly disagree with what you're saying right now. But I love the reasons why you believe what you do. Can you believe that? Can you believe it? So we did not agree to disagree. We ended up, after our argument, further apart, not, for, not closer together. She came to respect the reasons why I believe what I do. I came to a greater appreciation, gosh darn it, of how thoughtful and prayerful and sensitive and aware my daughter is. I wouldn't have that good at her age. Are you kidding me? And we totally disagree. We, we <laughs> like, whatever the scale of disagreement is, multiply that times a thousand. We are just like, couldn't be more opposite. And yet, how we grew to love and appreciate one another because of this third question. What moral priorities is that based on? Look at the second aspect of that question, right? Help me understand what is at stake from your point of view? What's at stake for you? That is a very revealing question, especially with our younger friends, with our younger colleagues, with our daughters and our sons. Because they are idealists. This generation coming up is very idealistic. I love that. Reminds me of back in the 60s, you know, the good old days. <laughs> They're very idealistic, and you need to find out more about the ideals that they're trying to champion. And like most young people, they tend to be somewhat single-minded. 
we can help them to think more broadly and complexly about these issues, but don't take away their idealism. And don't be surprised that the things that they're fighting for go bone deep because they have strong convictions about stuff. And they're not afraid to say it. But try to understand what's at stake for you. Why is this issue worth fighting for from your point of view? So I want to um, I want to talk about one more thing. Those are the great questions. That's how they unpa I unpack them. That's how I enact them with my, with my family, with my friends, uh, with my daughter, with my students. But let me just touch on one topic that I don't talk about in either of the videos, and that's the topic about what happens when intellectual hospitality isn't possible. In other words, what are the limits of intellectual hospitality? So this is a topic that really deserves a really long time, and I'm going to talk about it just briefly. I'm just going to touch on it. Maybe we can uh, talk about it another day. This is often a good topic to explore at a retreat. You might find some opportunities to talk with one another more in depth. What do you do when intellectual hospitality isn't possible? So sometimes intellectual hospitality isn't possible because the other person finds our beliefs unacceptable, and they break off communication. And sometimes intellectual hospitality becomes impossible because we ourselves need to set boundaries. Let's talk about boundaries first. Some of us have been in situations with particular individuals where we have been arguing and arguing and arguing and arguing. And it never gets better. It only gets worse. And we're fatigued. We're worn out. And sometimes we just need to say, I can't talk about that topic with you anymore. I think we've covered it. I think we understand each other. I think it's more hurtful than helpful for us to continue at it. And I just need to put a boundary and ask that you respect my view and that when we're together, um, that's just off the table, at least for now. We get to say that. We get to do that. We get to say, you know, this isn't working for me. This is hurtful for me. I need to set a boundary for now. That topic is off the table. Um, could you wait and maybe there'll be a time when I'm shifting, maybe when I'm in a better place, maybe when I'm more rested, maybe when I've had more time to process. But for now, would you respect a boundary and wait until I initiate that conversation on that topic? And that's okay. I want to give you permission to set a boundary if you need to. And that may be because of fatigue. That may be, be, be for uh, a thousand other reasons. But it's OK to come to a place where you say, you know, we've tried. It's not getting better. It's not helping. So let's put that to the side for now. And know that I love you, I'm committed to you. I enjoy your friendship. But that topic has to be one that we don't engage in for a while. What about on the other side? What about when someone else doesn't uh, respect our view and they leave, close the door? Those are painful. I think we've all had those situations where we've lost a friend, alienated a daughter or a son or a parent left a church or a fellowship, where for us, we just had to say, I, you know, when the other person sets a boundary or needs space, I think that we need to honor that, just as we want them to honor us when we put a boundary there. But here's what I always encourage folks to say. The door may be closed on your side, and it may be locked. But I want you to know that my door is always open to you. 
and at the point where you feel ready to connect casually or more deeply, I just want you to know that my door is open. And then our conversation from that point looks like that. My door is open. I miss you. My door is open if you ever feel ready. I just want you to know, thinking about you today, my door is open. If there'd be an opportunity for a cup of coffee, my door's open. And that language can make it possible to reconnect and reunite, even after really, really hard disagreements. Letting them choose whether or not they're going to come through that door requires... Let's see, it's right up here somewhere. Um, Humility. (laughs) Patience. And it also requires curiosity about what we think God might be able to do, even when we don't have us in the middle of it. If we really believe in the great big God that we really believe in, or that we say we do, what if we make room for God to maybe make a difference? For God to maybe tap that person on the shoulder, for God to be at work bringing others into that person's life that makes it possible for them to turn toward us. So we live in hope, patiently, (laughs) humbly, with curiosity and prayer to see what it is that God might do in that situation to make reuniting possible. God's a really big God. God's timetable is not like unto my timetable, I tell you. It's not. But sometimes when I get out of the way, leave a situation in God's hands, God can handle it a lot better than I can. So those are some thoughts about intellectual hospitality, about how I deal with some of these different aspects of it, how I go a little bit deeper in it. I think we've got about four minutes if you have some thoughts or would like to ask a clarifying question. Diana. Thank you. This is wonderful. Can you tell us a little bit about where the field of intellectual hospitality, unless it's not a field yet, <laughs> where is the influence growing so that people are doing work on issues, maybe with politics or other divisive issues? Yeah. The idea of intellectual hospitality is it's a phrase that's been used by scholars for a long time. And I'm um, really one of the voices that's trying to bring it back into our general conversation. I think it's really an important model that really helps us kind of navigate our way through some of these different situations. But there are a lot of people who are doing this kind of work. There are a lot of organizations. There are a lot of speakers. uh, There are a lot of different kinds of more elaborate models for communication that are exploring this. And uh, I'm, I'm... always learning about more. I usually try to post on my website, uh, which is down right now, but it's in process of uh, renewal. So you might keep an eye on that, dianaglier.com. Uh, there's a, on the landing page, there's a little, win, win, there's a, uh, I call it a doorway. That's not what my web designer calls it, uh, where you can click and then go in and you can see some of these things. But it, perhaps you know of some of these organizations or some of these models that are doing similar work under different names. Uh, because there are a number of them, because I think this, this idea that things have gotten so touchy is really tough, uh, not just on a, a, a political or spiritual uh, level, but on a very, very personal one, that it's really, really hard for us to talk about tough sub- uh, subjects that we're in what's sometimes called a cancel culture, canceling each other, not just canceling tough ideas. We're running from or opposing rather than leaning toward. But I think that our Christian faith is a really, really strong place for us to stand as we continue to try to make connections. And as I said at the beginning, in part that's because I think that there's an enemy who's trying to divide, but there's a Holy Spirit that brings us into a greater state of oneness, makes it possible for us to connect. Yes, please. Just respond to that division part that you said earlier. Yeah, I mean, we've come increasingly aware that God's a God of relationship. Yes. That, that's, that's essentially what life is. Yes. Uh, 
God's yeah, put me in a lot of places for these issues to arise in the last seven years. Uh, I found an, a helpful inflection point for me is where my reaction is to say, how can you think that? <laughs> to, to say, how can you think that? No, you know, uh, I mean, you're an intelligent person of goodwill. How, how can you think that? To actually, to, to turn that kind of revulsion or, you know, you idiot, you know, <laughs> uh, in, into a kind of curiosity. Uh, if I can do that, I, I find it inside, inside myself the ability to do that, to pivot at that point. Good. I like that. I think that, that that kind of shift, and that's where that pause we talked about is so valuable. Just that, that one pause, that one breath, and then shifting that attitude from one that is shocked and appalled to one that is interested and curious, uh, can, it can make all the difference. Absolutely. Good, good. Thank you for that. <laughs> I'm thinking about my family, and you know, we have a family that's on both sides of the spectrum. And so there are other family dynamics that are there. <laughs> but the, like a lifetime, maybe, yep. of patterns of dealing with things. Mm -hmm. And how do you discern or parse out what I could just ask an outsider maybe a question about, but then in the family, it's so loaded. Yeah. I don't know what to do. A couple thoughts uh, that I might share. One is that I, I don't know that we need all the information that we think we need. Um, you sound like you might be a little bit like me. I love to have everything figured out 100% before I do anything, right? I am frozen in inaction until I have everything like worked out. And I think that God is bigger than that. And I think that I just need to move forward sometimes, trusting that God's going to take care of the parts that I don't get, right? Uh, Emily P. Freeman is a, a podcaster whose work I really, really like. And her emphasis in that podcast, it's called The Next Right Thing. Because she, like me and maybe some of you, suffers from overwhelm and what she calls decision fatigue. So if I have a decision to make, I'm the kind of person to sit there and look at it a thousand ways before I figure out which one I'm going to do. And then I don't do anything. <laughs> right? Right? Emily P. Freeman says you don't have to ask yourself what are all the options and what are the pros and cons of each one. You just have to say what is the next right thing and as specific and small as possible. And her podcast has been very helpful for me. So that's one thing that may be helpful. The other thing I would just say is that in a relationship, especially a complex one, especially like a family relationship, the things that bug us, weigh us down, uh, things that we are burdened by that we can't stop thinking about are often completely oblivious to the other person. We assume that they are also obsessed with that one time when we did that one thing and then we said that thing about that thing. Right? I don't know. How many times have you had that where you assumed that and then you went to the person you said, remember that thing where you said and we did and that stuff? And they're like, what are you talking about? Right? And it's like, I have not spent one single day of my life without thinking about that when we were at the lake and we were the thing and they're like, I don't even remember going to the lake, right? So I, I think that we sometimes assume that other people's experience or perspective or even the weightiness of a particular event is the same as it is in ours. And um, I think we're often pleasantly surprised to discover that we've been carrying that burden needlessly. And it would have been wise to give it to the Lord way sooner than we do. Yeah. Our time is up. Um, from what I understand, yes. Um, let me close with a word of prayer and then I'll hang around for a little bit if you would like to chat. Uh, but let's go to the Lord in prayer. <sighs> Heavenly Father, I'm so very grateful for this room full of men and women determined, Lord God, to walk in your ways to the glory of your name. We thank you for a chance to chat with them, to explore with them, to get to know them better. I pray that you would be blessing this group, Lord God, abundantly, that their prayers would stay vibrant, that their compassion would run deep. I pray that you would give them vision, Lord God, for the next right thing that you're asking of them corporately 
and also as they reflect on individual relationships and conversations, Lord God. Give them light. Give them guidance. And help all of us, Lord God, as we continue to grow in patience, humility, and curiosity. That above all, Lord God, when people see us, they will know we are Christians by our love. We thank you for this time and we commit ourselves afresh to you and your kingdom purpose through Jesus, Lord of all. Amen. Thank you.